And that brings us to Majed El Shafi. He's become a great old pal of mine in recent years. His history is extraordinary, dynamic, uh, tragic in many ways. Um, he was born in Egypt, high-born, very sophisticated family of jurists, a Muslim by birth. At about the age of 18, he had an epiphany, decided to convert to Christianity, which turned out to be against the law. He was arrested, he was tortured. He managed an escape by Sidhu up the Gulf of Aqaba, sought political asylum in Israel, was granted that, lived there for three years, and eventually was resettled here to Canada under a UN uh, resettlement program. And since then, and ever, been, ever since he's, he's been here, uh, he's made it his business to pursue civil rights and justice all over the world. But in the moment, his particular task is to buy people. He's buying people. Majed El Shafi. I've been a freedom fighter since I was 18 years old. I've been fighting uh, to defend the people that are facing persecution for their belief uh, for the last 15 years or more right now. The persecution that's happening to these people is not something that I'm not familiar with. The main reason why I'm very passionate about it because I'm one of them. I used to be one of them. Between 200 to 300 million persecuted Christians in our world today, and nobody mentioned anything. You, you can speak about the persecution of any other minority, and the media will listen, the people will listen, but when you come to the persecuted Christians, nobody will listen. And I don't know why. When you hear persecution of Christians, you think it, it's something that happened in, in the early church years. I mean, immediately after the crucifixion of Christ, there was a lot of persecution. But actually, there's more persecution of Christians today than there was back then. So people need to, to know that, and not only to know it, but to care about it. Somebody need to fight for these people. With my own respect, since the existence of this law is not used anywhere but in personal disputes. Uh, I'm looking at an uh, example for democracy, and I'm looking for a lot. I spoke specifically about one specific attack was in October 9, the massacre of Maspiro. Without the power of women in the society, there is forced marriages. For the last two years, we've been working with the Afghan authority and for, with the Canadians about your case. The only way to get out of this issue is by killing me.
we can always kill the dreamer, but no one can kill the dreamer. Good afternoon, how are you this afternoon? Can you hear me loud enough? Yes. Egyptians is loud, but it's, but it's natural, so. <laughs> My name is Majid Shafi. I was born in February 17, 1977, which is mean that I'm still young and handsome. Thank you very much, indeed, I appreciate that. I was born from wonderful Muslim family back home in Egypt. I converted to Christianity when I was 18, was not statement, but it's my belief. You have the right to believe or not to believe. It's, the, it's not about debate of religion, it's about the freedom of religion. I started human rights organization underground in Egypt as a student in the law school and as a human rights lawyer. I was arrested, I was tortured severely by the Egyptian authority. It took me eight months to be able to walk again. I was hanged upside down, they put salt and lemon in my open wounds. Until now, I have my nightmares in the night. When you go through this, you have two options in your life, to become a victim or to become a victor. I decide that I will fight back, but not with machine guns, by human rights, by justice, by freedom. I escaped from Egypt to Israel, from uh, Israel through Amnesty International and United Nations. I came here to Canada 13 years ago. I started One Free World International for Human Rights to fight for other people that they used to be in the same place like myself. In all my years of when I was young, in my 20s, I was stateless. I traveled with a UN passport that there is no nationality. Um, just a few years ago, I stood in front of a Canadian judge and I, I'm standing in front of you right now as a very proud Canadian. The Canadian judge was asking me, he told me, son, what the first thing you want to do as a Canadian? I told him, your honor, I want to drink beer, watch how can complain about the weather. <laughs> he told me, son, you're a true Canadian. I told him, thank you, your honor, I appreciate that. <laughs> From Afghanistan and fighting for the minority there and women's rights, to Pakistan fighting for the slaves and rescuing them, all the way to Iraq where we cross the borders to ISIS, and I grow my beard, I'm, I'm a brown guy, so I, it's fine with me. If Moses went there, he will be arrested in two minutes. <laughs> but uh, with myself, I have a team on the ground, I'm able to cross the borders, we go get these girls and we bring them home safe and sound. So far, from the start of the conflict in, in Iraq, we was able to, to help to rescue more than 400 girls by grace of God. Mm -hmm. All the way to the Middle East, where right now we are discovering that the Arab Spring is turned to be a cold, deadly winter on the minority. Everybody thought that democracy can start in the Middle East. Democracy cannot happen between day and night. When you take a dictatorship out, you create a political vacuum. Who's using this political vacuum is the extremist. And this is something that we saw over and over in many countries. You cannot have democracy in the Middle East without establishing three foundations. Number one is education, education, education. Number two is the separation between the religion and the state. Number three and the last, this will be the freedom of religion. Right now, as, both of, as all of us sitting down here about the conflict and the time is running, I will not be able to go through the whole situation in the Middle East, but we are discovering more and more that the conflict with the Muslim community or the Muslim or the problem or with the Muslim community is not about the Muslim community itself. I'm not trying to be politically correct, trust me. Uh, how I can say this politely? Um, I don't give a shit about politically correctness. Like. But the dilemma that facing Islam as a faith today is not about the rising of the extremists, but is the silence of the moderate Muslims. We have to stand up, we have to fight back, and we have to support the moderate Muslims in an order for them 
to be able to fight the extremist. But enough talking about the problem, let's talk about the solution. And I'm not here just for you to paint you like a dark picture is the opposite. We will continue fighting and I know that we'll win this battle. But what's the solution? How we can get out of here? Now, if you are counting on the Canadian government to be the solution or the American government or Europe, think again. You are the solution. We are the solution. Don't wait for America. You be one of them. We have to understand that the minute that we stop fighting for each other, no matter what's our difference, if you are black or white, Jewish or Christians, smoke or doesn't smoke, I don't care. The minute that we stop fighting for each other, the minute that we lose our humanity, the truth and the reality here is that our world today is unfair place, is unjust place, not because the people is doing evil, but because the people who remain silent about it. History will not remember. <laughs> History will not remember the words of our enemy, but will remember the silence of our friends. Allow me to tell you this loud and clear. In the absence of light, darkness will prevail. And this is the truth. So many of you later on, in many of my speaking engagement will come and say, why so much hatred? Why so much people is dying? Why so much people killing other people? I don't know why there is hatred, and I don't understand hatred, and to be quite honest, I don't want to understand hatred. But here is what I know. I don't know why all of these crimes take place, but here is what I know. I know that the people of faith is dying every day for their belief, but they're still smiling. I know that we are in a very, in a very deep, dark night, but we still have the candle of hope. I know that our enemy, the enemy of freedom, the enemy of love, have a strong army, have a strong weapon, but we have the Lord Almighty. I, that's what I know. After every night, there is new morning, carrying new day. After every storm, there is sunshine. And after every persecution, there is victory. Here is what I know. They can always kill the believers, but they cannot kill the belief of our hearts. And they can always kill the dreamer, but no one can kill the dream. Thank you, and God bless. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Nine minutes forty one. Nine minutes forty one. <laughs> can I um, um thank you very much, thank you. Can I just make uh, one more remark? Uh, first of all, I'm the only speaker that still have nine minutes and fifteen seconds. <laughs> So just FYI, but anyway. Uh, I'm Egyptian, Moses Jewish is very awkward friendship, very. <laughs> and um, I just want to say uh, this man, because he came out of the Holocaust, he and his family, he understood the pain that we're going through. And he was there always for us, even though he didn't have to. But he was always in the front line with us. He was always the voice for the voiceless with us. And I'm not saying this to kiss his behind. It's the truth. Um, one time I was sitting down with Moses, and we always tease each, each other because, you know, Arab and Jew, that's what we do. <laughs> and uh, one day I told Moses, I told him, Moses, do you know why Jewish men get circumcised? He said, why? I told him, because Jewish women like everything 50% of. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, <laughs> and, after that, and after that, he reminded me that I was born Muslim and I have the same problem. So thank you very much. Thank <laughs> 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 you.